Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who is our King, who is our Lord, who redeems and restores, who is slow to anger, but abounding in compassion, who sees our weakness and gives us strength, who sees our hopelessness and gives us hope, who gives of himself for the nations, who has given us Jesus, his Son. Blessed are you, God. Blessed are you, God. You have made us a people. You have brought us into a family. You have given us a purpose. And you are present with us. We praise your name. We honor you. We magnify you, O oh God. For you bring life where there is death. Speak to us, Spirit of God, that we might become who you've called us to be. We pray all this in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen and amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you would turn those on, or you can use an old school Bible like mine, uh, and turn to Colossians 1. We're going to be reading verses 15 through 23 this morning. 15 through 23, it'll also be up on the screen. Uh, but listen for these words. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You were once alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moving from the hope held out in the gospel. And this is the gospel that you have heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. The word, word of God, God the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is a very famous passage in Colossians and in fact uh, in the entirety of Scripture. It, it is a hymn or a poem of sorts. If you were to go look into the Greek, you would see that it is laid out like a poem. It rhymes. It has, uh, it has a rhythmic feel to it as Paul lays out very intentionally the answer to the question of who is who is Jesus? It's a very powerful question, a difficult one for us to ask uh, or answer with precision. Because there is so much to say. And as John writes, I suppose not all the books of the world can contain the knowledge about Jesus, who he is, and what he does. In this passage, as we talked about last week, Paul is speaking to the Colossians who have come out of idolatry and pagan practices who have ceased degrading themselves for the sake of gods that do not exist, who have given up philosophies and ideologies and have turned to the one true God, their creator. They're young in the faith. They're learning. They're new. Paul is the 
their father in the faith. They rely a great deal on what he says. And Paul is writing this letter to urge them to be careful because they are hearing of these philosophies, one in particular that we can't identify precisely, though we have some ideas what it might be. They're being enticed to participate, or at least to mix their faith with this new philosophy to give in, uh, to, to follow, if you will, another gospel contrary to the one that Paul has given to them. Paul is telling them that this is who Jesus is. If you want to know, he is more than a teacher. He's more than a guru. He's more than a cult leader. He's more than a prophet or a priest. Or an incredible preacher. He's something more. He isn't one of many teachers and philosophers. He is the creator of all things. In fact, what Paul does here, we won't go into detail about this, is he ties Genesis 1-8, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis 1-8 to, um, to Proverbs. 8.22. He ties these two together. What is this all about? We talked about this a few weeks back, so I won't labor the point enough to say that in Judaism there is this thought or idea that when God gave the law, or what is properly called the Torah, the teaching, when God gave that to Moses, that he gave part of himself in the giving of that. That he was giving part of his nature, his soul, his being to the Hebrew people so that they would in covenant understand that he is a giving of himself in a marriage of sorts with his people for all time. It's a beautiful picture. A piece of the soul. It's kind of like in marriage that when we give ourselves to the other person exclusively, what we're saying in that is we give our souls to one another. That's what it means when it says that the two will become one flesh. There is a combining, a union, a giving. And that picture is what Paul is talking about in combining Genesis 1 and Proverbs 8. And I'll explain that in a second. There is a mingling of the soul that in Judaism they believe that the very essence of God is given in the Torah, which makes you understand why they revere it so much. God is giving of himself. But in Proverbs 8, there is a, a lengthy passage and also in some extra biblical literature uh, about the divine wisdom. That wisdom, Proverbs 8 says, was in the beginning with God. That wisdom assisted God in the making of all things. That wisdom was present at the very beginning of creation itself. And taking a cue off of John, who in John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That word, W-O-R-D, in the Greek is logos. It is the divine principle which holds all things together. The supreme philosophy, the lofty ideology that is present in the world, the truth, if you will. And what Paul does magnificently as he ties all these together in Jesus and says the divine wisdom at the beginning, the unifying principle of the logos in all things is summed up in this person, Jesus, who is the son of God. Through him, Paul says, everything that was made, everything that was created exists. And in him, it exists and holds together. And it does all this for him. God didn't so much make the world for you and I as he did for Christ. We get the wonderful privilege of being part of God's creation. But the world and everything that was made was made in him, by him, for him. And Paul is taking these and telling them that this Jesus is more. He's not just a cult leader. He's not just one of many philosophies. He is the philosophy. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way apart from that. He is central to what it means to be a Christian. 
There can be no faith, there can be no Christ, uh, or Christian, without Christ. He is the foundation of everything that you and I believe. Pastor, we know this. Could you land the plane? But I don't think we really understand that enough. You see... We, like the Colossians, are tempted. We talked about this last week. We're enticed. We're, we're, we're uh, spoken to by different narratives and different gospels uh, about a variety of things. We are bombarded by this on social media and on the TV. The only way that we can escape this plethora of philosophies and ideologies is to go live in Alaska in the wilderness. And even then, I think, somehow they'd find their way to us. There's discussion all the time about what is the best way to live. What is the good life? What what is the best way to perceive and to act in this life? And the Colossians were struggling with the same things. We're not so different from them. They too were exposed to all sorts of things. The city of Colossae was home to many religions and philosophies. And yet Paul tells them that everything that we are is summed up in Christ. Now why is that important? Because it it focuses the gospel among many. Paul says in this in verse 23, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from this hope held out in the gospel. And then he says this. All that he's just said is the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. John Calvin talks about the gospel in this way. He says it's not a doctrine of the tongue. It cannot be grasped by reason and memory only. But it is fully understood when it possesses the whole soul and penetrates to the inner recesses of the heart. The gospel is not a philosophy for us to embrace or understand as much as it is a way of life for us to undertake. It's not information to be stored. It's not understanding what the right thing is. It is the action of living in accordance with our Creator's wishes. And the gospel is this powerful thing that we don't so much get a hold of, but that gets a hold of us. And when it does its work, it transforms us little by little by little by little over a long period of time. The gospel is not something that we hear once and go, hey, that's great, and then move on with our life. No, it shapes our life. It transforms our soul. It does what no charity, what no ideology, what no philosophy, what no economy, what no political institution can do. It shapes and transforms the human soul. That's the gospel, and the gospel centered in a person, Jesus It's Jesus that changes our lives. It's Jesus that transforms our soul. He is the one through whom all things have created, uh, were created. And he's also the one that is the first in the new creation. That was the first in the resurrection. That was, is the leader that guides us to the place we want to go. In Matthew's ideology, in his thinking, in his gospel, Jesus is the new Moses. Who is taking all of us on a new exodus. But it's not out of this world as if this world is so evil and corrupt and irredeemable that it, its very nature, it's evil. No, the creation is good. Remember Genesis 1, God made all these things and said it's good. It's very good. It's simply been corrupted. It's been twisted. It's been ripped and torn and shredded. It's become something it was never intended to be, but God is not finished with it. 
The process of being saved or, 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 or following Jesus, we have all these terminologies in Christianity, don't we? We have all of these little sayings that people who are new to faith come in and they say, we don't know what that means. When we were in Israel, we always stopped by this shop called Shorshim, and in there he, we have a dialogue, and he gives a perspective uh, about Christianity from an Orthodox Jew's standpoint very pleasantly and takes questions and discussions and it's this incredible learning opportunity about two faiths that are actually so closely tied together unlike anything else. And one of the things he says is that when a Christian comes in and and asks a Jew, have you been saved? Well, we all know what that means, right? We're going to heaven. We're going to be with Jesus. We, we are a follower of Christ. We're a member of a church. We know that some things in our life are different. But for them, they say, from what? For what? What do you, like, like I, I ate an olive and was choking on the pit and you gave me the Heimlich maneuver and I've been saved. Or maybe I was drowning and you threw me. What? Saved from what? We think it has more to do with our exit from this world. This world is a difficult place to live in, amen? Even when you have more resources than other people to navigate it, it's still hard because suffering doesn't look at our bank account when it hits. It it, it doesn't go, oh wait, these people have resources, so we're not going to touch them. No, suffering is something that hits all of us because we're human. So the big, the great, and the small alike are all touched by the difficulties of life. All of us. So we all suffer in this life. It's difficult. But that doesn't mean that the world is corrupt and we got to get out of here because it's irredeemable and there's nothing we can do. And thank God when we pass from this life to the next because we won't have to deal with this anymore. That is not an idea that is expressed in the scriptures. Did you know that? No, the scriptures are very different. The scriptures talk about how God is still interested in this world. Do you know that? God has not written us off as a loss. God is interested in redeeming the world, the created order. It is by rights his, and he is still interested in it. Otherwise, why would he send his son to redeem it? To be the first of the new creation. To live a life that is exemplary for you and I. To know what it means to truly be human. God is still interested in this world. Now what he's talking about when we have that idea of being saved is, and when he uses that in scripture, when Paul writes that, he means being saved out of this world's system, out of this world's culture, and to what it means to truly live, to not be caught in the rat race, to not be caught up in all of the things that were daily accosted that we need to be. You need to be healthier. You need to run further. Are you active? You're not active enough. Okay, you're active too much. Well, you can have eggs. No, you can't have eggs. Okay, you can have one egg. Now you can have a half an egg. Now don't even look at eggs. Sugar's bad for you. No, it's really good for you. Carbohydrates are bad. No, they're really good. They do all this. Uh, or you've got to have this, this many 401ks and three CDs and four investments. And do you have a financial advisor? And why not? Oh, you don't have my financial advisor. So you need to get that one because he's better than yours. Who uh, On and on and on. You get this all the time. We get, we get emails from people we don't know trying to sell us things we don't need for money we don't have. In two days, I've gotten four emails that my Netflix account is canceled. We, we're constantly hit over and over and over again. And it would be so easy to just fly, go right along with the flow, to submit to what it means to live the American dream, to submit to what it means to be economically and financially sound, to submit to what it means to be correct in our thinking, politically correct. We could submit that. It would be easy. But it's so small. Christ saves us 
out of this world, to be his agents in this world, to bring about his purpose of transformation. There's a new exodus and Jesus is leading the way out into a new way of life. Not exit from this life, but fullness in this life. I have come that they might have life, but they'll only have that life after this one because it's irredeemable. Now, that's not in the scripture, but we believe that many times. I have come that they might have life and have it to the fullest. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that transforms, and at the center of that is Jesus. So you know about the what and the who, and now why? Why has God done this? Because God is interested in redeeming creation in all things. That means that if we are to be a part of what God is doing, if we are to submit and believe the gospel and to follow after our Lord, then it's going to affect how we live. It's going to affect the decisions we make. Uh, it's going to affect how we raise our kids, how we discipline them, who we marry, if we're going to marry, where we live, where we work, what field we work in, the decisions we make about our neighbors and about how we're going to live in this life, the realization that everything we do affects someone else. Everything. That's the gospel. You and I are called to live into this new world that is already and not yet. It's already come in Jesus. It's already been inaugurated in the church. God has already given his spirit. So it's already present, but it's not in its fullness. We know that. It's not perfect. I hear all the time uh, in discussions and talk with people about, uh, about how the church is so broken, how they've had so many issues. I had a couple of conversations about that this week, that, that, that how can we rely on this system? How can we rely on brokenness? And they're looking for something that can never be found, a perfect institution. There doesn't exist a perfect institution. Why? Because we're involved in it. Because people are broken and fallen and they bring that brokenness. But nevertheless, the church is the instrument through which God brings his redemption in the world. The church, by God's knowing alone, is the instrument he will use to shape and to transform the world. And you and I are called to be a part of that. It's not just about Sunday morning worship. It's not just about tithing. It's so much bigger than that. It's about being transformed yourself and in doing so being a witness to your family and to your neighbors. It's about gathering with the people of God to encourage each other in what God has called all of us to do. It's about leaving this world system and stepping into a new way of living. About serving and not being served as our Lord was. This world belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the devil. It doesn't belong to a political party, to a particular nation, uh, to a group of people who meet in Davos and decide what the world's going to do doesn't belong to any of them. It belongs to the Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. He wants it back. And he's going to get what he wants. And he's extending the hand to you and I to be a part of this. How? By being rude, by pointing out people's faults, by beating them over the head. No, by inviting them to walk with you and doing what Nathaniel said. Come see a man. What the woman at the well said. Come see a man who told me about my life about being hope for the hopeless, about giving kindness to the stranger, about bringing people who are not your family into your home to eat at your table. That's the gospel. That's what God desires. Interesting, I've checked the scriptures a few times. Jesus was not a registered Republican or Democrat. 
I rather think of him as saying what the angel of the Lord said to Joshua in the midst of a battle as Joshua walks out and encounters the angel of the Lord and said, whose side are you on? And the angel of the Lord said, I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. And if we try and fit Jesus into a political party or into an economic system or into a social order, we've missed the whole point. No, those things bend to him, not the other way around. And you and I must also adjust our lives to him, not the other way around. Because God's purpose in Christ is to make us holy, not happy. Holy. Set apart. Not somehow better. But if our Lord is any indication, making ourselves lesser about being the people who will bring about a new order on the earth, who will lead a new exodus, who will gather people with them to bring them into the goodness of God. N.T. Wright, one of my favorite commentators, talks about this passage in Colossians. This is what he says. God's purpose then is to create a holy people in Christ. This he has already done in principle. By dealing with sin on the cross and thus already achieving reconciliation. This he is doing. So you have the past, he's already done it. This he is doing in the present, in practice, by refashioning their lives according to the pattern of the perfect life, the life of Christ. And just like in the past and the present, this he will do, right, says... This he will do in the future when that work is complete and the church enjoys fully that which at present it awaits in hope. The present process which begins with patient Christian living and ends with the resurrection itself will result in Christians being presented without shame or fear before God as glad subjects before their king. This is the gospel that has gotten a hold of us. This is the life we've been called into. And folks, anything less than this is not enough. The Christian life is not one in which we give up so much and we could be having so much more fun and living so much more life out there. No, those things are too small. Their ultimate end is too shallow. It's insufficient for human life. But the gospel is what life is all about. It's what it was supposed to be. Creator and created living together. God with us. We just came through the beginning of the Christian year. Advent. In which we celebrate Emmanuel. God with us us you know I've never understood that more than when we went to New York to see my daughter and her husband and my son and his wife came up and and my son-in-law's sister and her boyfriend came over and we gathered together and we went all over New York we probably looked like a bunch of hayseeds running around not knowing where things are with our mouths open but we had the best time and it's not because the food was good it was it's not because the, the journey was exciting, it was. It's not because we purchased things we did. It's not because we went to a particular place. It's because we were together. We were together. And it didn't matter where we, we could, have, we could have gone somewhere that there wasn't much going on. We could have had a, just a get together in a field in the middle of West Texas where there's nothing And we would have still been just of the greatest attitude because we were together. That's what the gospel is about. God is with us and we are with God. It's the fulfillment of what the prophet said that one day, Isaiah said, that God will be their God and the people will belong to God. 
That's what we're a part of. That's what we're called to be a part of. Don't settle for a lesser life. But recognize and build your life on Christ, the very center of our faith, and the one who transforms. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us pray. The new exodus has begun. Jesus is calling all of us out of the culture of this world and into a new way of life. Will you join him? I pray that you will. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.